Welcome to uh, the study of uh, the book of Genesis. And uh, we're going to spend the next ten classes together uh, going through uh, these 50 chapters, which are the God's introduction to the Bible. This course is called Exposition of Genesis. Um, it's not exegesis of Genesis. We aren't going to go word for word, right, and do a Hebrew grammar analysis, right? But we are going to lay open the sense of the meaning of the text. Uh, we're going to explain it and interpret it uh, to, to hit on the main themes in the book, to get the overall picture, to look at important types, to draw significant personal lessons from the lives of the patriarchs. Uh, we're going to especially see how creationism is essential to to biblical Christianity. You have to believe in creationism. You can't believe in evolution. Okay. You, um, we're going to see the, uh, the logic and the value of believing in a worldwide flood. Uh, it has tremendous ramifications you know, for, for human history. And, um, and we're going to see how especially God narrowed his interest after creation, after maybe a few thousand years, he narrowed his focus on one group of people of all the nations of the world, uh, among whom to dwell and to work and to, and to deal in covenant relationship. And there was reasons for that. And we see a very interesting development in the book of Genesis um, with this group of people. Uh, the requirements uh, for this course, and, uh, and you can see this in your notes when you get them, is that you have to read the book of Genesis once uh, during the next two weeks. You have to read this textbook once. Textbook? Yes. Okay. Now, I'll probably extend the reading deadline, you know, beyond the two weeks. Okay. I'll extend. How many pages? How many pages? No, how many pages? I'm sorry? Uh, this is the only one I have. There's one more at the bookstore, and I've ordered two, and they should be in at the end of the week. So I'll, what I'll do is I'll give you the, um, you know, a month to read it or something. Okay. But uh, you have to read this book for the course. Okay. You get your marks. This is a, this is a commentary in the book of Genesis. Um, it's the best one I know, and it's written by a man who is a scientist as well as a Christian. Not a Christian scientist. You know, not, not the cult Christian scientist. But he's a tr he was an actual si He is alive today. His name's Henry Morris. He just retired uh, from the leadership of Institute for Creation Research in California. His son, John, has taken the leadership of the ministry. This man had a, a doctor's degree in hydrology, I believe it was. And he worked for many years in the secular world in industry. He's a, you know, he's a first-rate scientist. I don't know exactly what, I think it's 1976. Yeah. So it's uh, 20 years ago. I, I don't think that we as Christians need to make any apology for believing in creationism and in a worldwide flood. I think that scientific evidence is on the side of believers, even though, you know, in many instances it does boil down to a matter of faith, what you believe, you know, because we can't replicate creationism any more than they can replicate evolutionism. Right? But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Okay, the point is, is that uh, this is an excellent, an excellent commentary in the book of Genesis. It's devotional. It's uh, it's written by a godly man, and uh, and yet he has insights that you won't get in, in in most other commentaries in the book of Genesis because he's a scientist and he writes 
a lot of the first 11 chapters from a scientific perspective, and it's really valuable, really valuable. Um, and so, just to read through this book, and it has, he has uh, wor- he has every verse in the book of Genesis in here too. So if, as you read through the text, you know you'll get 15% of your course marks completed just from reading. Okay, 15% of your mark in the end is just from reading. 25% of your um, course mark will be on answering a list of questions for part one in the book. The book of Genesis is in two parts. The first 11 chapters is primeval history, ancient world history, or even ancient history of the cosmos, the whole solar system. Okay, And chapters 12 to 50 is the history of the patriarchs, patriarchal history. So just remember that. Primeval history and patriarchal history. And those are the two divisions of the book of Genesis. Eleven chapters for primeval history and uh, what? 39 chapters of patriarchal history. What's interesting about these two divisions of the book is that we have four main events recorded in, in the first division in primeval history. We have the creation of the world, we have the fall of man, we have the flood, and we have the Tower of Babel. Okay? Those four ancient events have profoundly affected our world. We have to understand them, and that's why God put them in there. It explains, um, it explains the nature of the, co- of the cosmos. It, it explains the curse. It explains the problems that humanity has. You see? It, it, it explains salvation history. Right? It explains nations and groups and peoples. It explains languages, you see, and so forth. It even explains the races, you know, the different colors and, uh, and so forth. Right? The second division in the book talks about four, four people, okay? the four, four patriarchs of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Right? So four main events in the first division, four main men, or people in the second division. It's a very easy outline to remember, you know, but it's it's accurate. It's a really accurate summary of the event. And in the first division, the first 11 chapters, there are many, many questions that people have that you have to have an answer for as a Christian. So now that we're studying the book of Genesis, you will do the research on these questions, and you will answer those questions. Questions like, who authored Genesis if Moses didn't? And to critique the other viewpoints. Yeah, who wrote the book if Moses didn't write the book? Okay, and many, many Bible-believing Christians have gone to universities, seminaries around the world in the last 200 years and have lost their faith in the literalness of the Bible and the literalness of these events and have become evolutionists you see, because they were told that Moses didn't write the book, and therefore if Moses didn't write the book, then it's the result of people that wrote thousands of years after these events who were merely writing myth and tradition. And so if we change the nature of this book from something that is literally true into something that is only mythological and legendary and traditional, and whose own and its only value is lessons, moral lessons. Then we lose the foundation for our faith. It's really it, this is where many people become liberals right off the bat. What they are taught about Genesis turns them into a, a theological liberal. They don't believe the Bible is literal, and it's really dangerous. Right? And many many pastors and churches today, you know, this is where they they. They were deceived right at the outset of their education when they failed to understand the book of Genesis the way God intended it to be understood. Okay. Um, many people believe that evolution and, and, and the Bible fit together. Um, that God used evolution as his process by which to create the world. It's, it's, it's a compromised view. Right? And you have to answer that question. You know, were the days in, of creation in Genesis chapters 1 and 2, were they literal 24-hour days? Or were they ages, day ages? 
of maybe thousands or millions of years. Okay? You have to answer that. Okay? Um, is there a gap in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 when it says that the, wor the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep? Um, there is a theory called the gap theory that says that the, in, there, there was an original creation and then Satan fell and so God started over and he just, just told he destroyed everything that he originally made and he started over what we read in the first, in the six days of creation is the second actual creation a recreation right which which then leads to another question were there people before Adam and Eve was there a pre-Adamic civilization and um, I think sometime this week there's going to be a couple of guys sitting in the class that actually believe that believe this and this is uh, when I, I just preached the funeral la last week and the people in whose home I was visiting uh, they the mother and one of the sons believes in a pre-Adamic civilization and we've had a three hour Bible study on this you know and uh, he believes that this is the only good explanation as to where Cain got his wife see that she was one of these people that had descended from the original pre-Adamic civilization otherwise God was uh, sort of giving his stamp of approval on incest within Adam's family where Cain must have got his wife from one of his sisters you know and so see this is a it's, it's a difficult question and it plagues people and many people holds that very single question up as a as a logical objection as a theological objection to the truthfulness of the Bible you know, and so then they close the Bible and say it's garbage. You know, that's how they reason. See, so we have to have answers to all of these questions, good answers, right? And of course, uh, in the flood, the ark uh, is a profound picture of Jesus Christ. And I'm sure that the day that Jesus raised from the dead and walked with those two disciples who were on the road to Emmaus so many thousands of years later here you know that when he opened up the scriptures and showed himself in all the law the prophets and the writings things concerning himself I'm sure he must have talked about the ark although it doesn't tell us but that's more of a devotional study that I want everybody to do you know I want you to carefully read the story of, of the flood and, and the preparation for the ark and how it was made and, and how it was designed and, and so forth what it did and what the New Testament says about it you see to, to, to learn some uh, neat types and pictures of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament it's a good study right I have about four pages of questions that relate to the second part of the book Abraham Isaac Jacob and Joseph that mainly deal with chronology right that if you're going to be a Sunday school teacher and teach kids, you have to do a chronological study of, of these men in their time so that you will properly tell the stories. Um, the, I was just flabbergasted. I'm telling you, I, I got so excited a few years ago when I started my own, you know, I started to really get into the book of Genesis myself. I started to study it and compare scripture with scripture. And I had always had the impression for years, ever since I was a kid, that when Joseph ran away from home to keep keep his brother Esau from killing him, or Jacob rather, when Jacob fled to pay Dan a ram for his life, that he must have been, you know, 15 or 20 or, you know, 25 years of age or something. He wasn't married, you know, he was a young man, it looked like, you know. And, and I discovered from studying carefully that he was 71 years old when he ran away from home. <laughs> you know, it just changes the story dramatically. This man was not a teenager who was being rebellious. He, he was an endemic. He was a... Uh, he was perverted in his soul. This man was a liar and deceiver to the max, you know. 
70 years of his life he'd lived in deception. You see? So that changes the story and the way you tell the story. Yeah. And so it's those kinds of questions that you, that you need to do. And so 20 25 percent of your course mark is going to come from your own research and answering a list of questions that relates to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, forcing you to get into the text of Genesis and to do that kind of study yourself. And you'll find it fascinating. You know, it's not just work. It's going to be fascinating to study. I think you'll really enjoy it. I also want you to watch three creationist video videos from Institute for Creation Research. Right? We have them on the shelf out there. We've got eight or ten of them. And uh, I want you to just pick three and watch them. Okay? Uh, if I, You either do that or read five articles in a creationist magazine. Okay? That's only worth 5% of your mark. And then there'll be 30% of your mark will be a final test. All right? In these research assignments, for the first time ever, <laughs> I am going to be deducting marks for poor spelling, poor grammar, and um, bad sentence structure. Okay, so I think it's time, you know, that uh, you started proofreading what you give to me <laughs> instead of just running it off and sending it in. Okay, I want you to fix it up and make it look good. Okay, I give you the best notes I can, but I think you should give me the best papers you can. All right, and uh, you should practice being able to express yourself accurately and. Precisely. Now, if you've got uh, your Bibles with you, turn to Genesis chapter 1, and we're going to spend the rest of the morning today doing an introduction to the book of Genesis itself. All right? And um, this will be uh, a bit of review for you, some of you, I suppose, if you have taken Bible survey. Have you done the synthesis of Genesis to Ruth or something? I taught it? Okay. <coughs> then I won't. I won't spend very much time on it because I do want to finish off the lesson today, especially dealing with the chronology of the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. I want to spend class time with you on that today. This class is going to, especially, the most important aspect of this class is the chronology of chapters 1 to 11. We're going to do that today in class. And then the first class next week, I'm going to give you an overview. I'm not going to give you all the information because I want you to find some of it for these for these questions for that second part of the course. But I will give you a, a general overview of the chronology of from Abraham to Joseph with select references that shows how old they were, you know, and, and the main events of their lives. And uh, that's, that's really essential to understand the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis uh, is known in our Bibles as Genesis. And uh, you can look up the word Genesis in a dictionary, and it has a, it has a non-biblical meaning. It has a secular meaning. Do you know what Genesis is? We, you, you hear talk about the, people talking about the genesis of a movement or a, a, gen, a genesis of... Um, of an organization. What does that mean? Origins. Yeah. The origin or the beginning of something. Okay. And so that's exactly what Genesis means in the Bible, too. It means origins. It means the beginning. Okay. Uh, if you look this up in a, in a Septuagint, if you look up the title for the first book in the Bible in the Septuagint, which is a Greek translation of the Old Testament, the, uh, the book is called um, He Biblios Geneseos, which means the book of beginnings or the book of the generation of so and so and so and so and so and so. And that's because ten times in the book of Genesis there's a phrase that is found. And let's look them up together. Okay? Turn with me to chapter 2, verse 4. For the first example, would somebody read that? Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made earth and heaven. Yeah, I want you to throw that Bible away in case you 
just for just for a sec. Yes. Okay. Got to have a King James here today. In my Bible, it says, "These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens." Okay. These are the generations of. Right. The next reference is in chapter five, verse one. Somebody want to read that one? Yeah. This is the book of the generations of Adam, in the day that God created the man, the likeness of God made in Jesus. The book of the generations of Adam. All right? Chapter 6, verse 9. So we read that one. So we have this phrase repeated uh, throughout the book. Chapter 10, verse 1 reads, Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And unto them were sons born after the flood. Chapter 11, verse 10. These are the generations of Shem in particular. See, See how it's getting more detailed? The first is the book of the generations of the heavens and the earth. And then it's the book of the generation of Adam. And then it's the book of the generations of Noah. And then it's the book of the generations of Noah's three sons. And then it gets even more detailed. It focuses on the book of the generations of Shem. You see, Shem was 100 years old and begot Arphaxad two years after the flood. Okay? We come to verse 27 in this chapter. Now these are the generations of Terah. See? Terah was descended from Shem who is descended from Noah, who is descended from Adam, you see, who was created by God. So what, what the author, I think what Moses did is that he had documents at his disposal, he had oral traditions at his disposal, and what he did is he took these. The, the, in fact, it's very possible that the form that we have the book of Genesis in at least good sections of the book of Genesis were wrote memory. They, they were memorized word for word and passed down from father to son, from generation to generation. It's very likely that these are, that this format that we see repeated throughout the book in ten different places was meant as a memory key for, for these people to memorize. Yeah. And uh, there are cultures today where uh, documents five times the size of the Bible are passed on by memory from one generation to another. Yeah. As, a, as, a, as a matter of fact, that there are, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, in India and in the Middle East there, in some of the Arab cultures, there are phenomenal amounts of literature that are passed on by memory. You know, people memorize these things and pass them on to their children. And uh, it's word for word. Oral traditions. For us, we, we don't put much confidence or put much stock in an oral tradition because our members are very poor. But our members are poor because our members are not trained members. You see. Uh, but there are cultures, and the Jewish culture was like this, where boys were taught to train the members. And so therefore they could accurately, without mistake, you know, pass on massive amounts of, of accurate information from one generation to another. So this is what we see here, the generations of Terah. Terah begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran begot Lot. The next one is 25 verse 12 in the book. <coughs> now these are the generations of Ishmael, Abram, Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's handmaid, bore unto Abraham. Also, verse 19, these are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begot Isaac. Right? And so we have the story developing from Adam to Noah to Shem, Ham, and Japheth, descended from Noah, specifically to Shem, and then within Shem's line 
to Terah, from Terah to Abraham, and then from Abraham to, to two lines, Ishmael and Isaac. Right? That's what we've seen. And then the last reference to this phrase in the book is chapter 36, verse 1. Now these are the generations of Esau, who is Edom. And Esau traces back to to Yes, he traces back to Abraham through which son, Ishmael or Isaac? Yeah, I. That's right. Abraham had two sons. Well, he had several more sons, but he had the, the two sons um, that in biblical history are the key sons, right? Ishmael was the oldest. Isaac was the son of promise. Okay. Now Ishmael had many children. Isaac had two sons. They were twins, Jacob and Esau. Yeah. And uh, Isaac had Generational literature in Genesis tells no, us the descendants of Abraham, Esau. Abraham had Ishmael and Isaac, and then Isaac had Jacob and Esau, right? Jacob had 12 sons, right? And, and so did Esau. Okay. I believe Esau, it says here he had 12. Or Ishmael, one of the two. But. Um, and so what this does is this traces uh, through the whole history of the book of Genesis, the four patriarchs and the peoples that were not part of the godly line or the line of promise, their development is also traced down through, necessarily, because it, they provide the historical context you know, for, the, for the people of promise. All right. The Hebrew title for the book of Genesis is uh, Bereshith, or B Bereshith, which means in the beginning. And the Hebrews had a way of uh, naming their books after the, simply the first word or a, or a word in the first phrase of their books. That was just the way they did it. Right? Bereshith, uh, Ara, Elohim, uh, Hashemayim, Ba'aretz. That's the first word, or the first verse in, in the Hebrew Bible. In the beginning, Bara, he created, Elohim, God, Hashemag of the heavens, Baharats, and the earth. Okay? And so um, that's the first word of the book, and so that's the way the Hebrews. Okay? Uh, the, the title in the Hebrew Bible for the book of Exodus, our book of Exodus, is called, And It, and it Came to Pass. And it came to pass because that's the uh, that's the first word in the book. You know, it's just they didn't always do it that way, but very odd. Okay. So I think the English titles are probably a little bit more meaningful sometimes than the Hebrew titles, the English and the Greek titles. Um, so our English title for the for the book of Genesis comes from the Greek, and the Greek is based on the contents of the book that relates to the generations and the beginnings of the generations. Okay. So it's thematic. English title. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the authorship of the book. Uh, you can take the time to read through that on yourself. The key to the authorship question is this. There's two things. Number one, there's no question if you read and accept the Bible literally that Moses wrote Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Explicit reference. In fact, we'll read a couple of references. Uh, turn with me to Exodus chapter 17. Would you read that one, Mandy? Exodus 17, 14. Chang, would you read Numbers 33, 2? And Bob, would you read Deuteronomy 31, 19? 
I read it loud enough where it'll show up on the tape. Can you <coughs> say, number uh, numbers 33 2 for you. Right. Okay, first, the Exodus reference. And the uncircumcised man child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people, he has broken my covenant. That doesn't sound right. 1714. Exodus. Exodus. Uh, you want to read the Numbers reference while she's read, looking that up? Numbers 33, 2. Okay, I'm sorry. Numbers. Chapter 33, verse 2. Okay. And Moses drove their going out according to their journey by the commandment of the Lord. And these are their journeys according to their going out. Okay. And so at that point in the book of Numbers, we have a summary of the travels of Israel in the wilderness. And it specifically says Moses wrote them down, specifically. Okay? Deuteronomy? Deuteronomy 31.19. Now therefore write you this song for you, and teach it to you, the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths. But this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. Maybe you better read verses 24 to 26. 24. And it came to pass when Moses had made an end of writing the words of this law in a book until they were finished, that Moses commanded the Levites, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, saying, Take this book of the law and put it in the sign of the ark of the covenant of the Lord, your God, that it may be therefore a witness against thee. Okay. So it's it's pretty explicit that Moses wrote a book and he put it in the uh, in the Ark of the Covenant. See. And uh, it, it included not only the eyewitness accounts of the events that transpired that he was an eyewitness to, but it also included the songs that he wrote and the teachings that he gave to the people. You know, he was instructed by God to write these things down. The book of Deuteronomy uh, has numerous references to, to Moses writing things down. Right? And that other reference in Exodus 17. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Emma from under the heaven. Right. Okay, so. Uh, God instructed Moses to write it down you know, and give it to Joshua to proceed to keep it. So we have in Exodus, we also have it in Numbers, and we also have in Deuteronomy numerous statements that indicate that Moses wrote what he wrote. And for people to deny that shows you their, their wrong assumptions towards the Bible. You know, in turn. And all liberals do this. They simply reject those statements under the Bible so they don't mean what they say. They, they, they have all kinds of other theories about who wrote the book. So, but number one fact to remember is that the Bible says that Moses wrote Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. It says he did. Okay. Now, the, the big question is, well, it doesn't say he wrote the book of Genesis. In fact, the events in the book of Genesis all occurred prior to Moses' birth because he wasn't born in the chronology of events until the book of Exodus, chapter 3, or chapter 2, if you, if you remember the story. They were, the people were already slaves down there, and he was born to slave parents, and he was miraculously saved from being destroyed as a, as a boy child. Right? So how could Moses have written the events prior to his time? There's only one possible way. Well, maybe two. He either was... Uh, given that information through memory, through oral tradition from his father, who had learned it from his father, and so forth. And which is, which there is, it's, there's a good chance that that happened. Or even probably more plausible, God probably simply revealed some of that stuff to him. Or it could be a combination of those factors. You know, that he was given some of that by divine revelation, you know, and or he edited and, and, and collected material, you know, and wrote down material that in, in, up to this point had been in, in oral form only or something like that. Okay, 
So there's, it's not difficult for us to see how Moses could have written the book of Genesis. Okay. But the connection is, is that we know he wrote Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And the second argument is that because of the unity of the, of the five books, the Pentateuch, because of the unity of those five books, it's obvious that the same man wrote the first one. That's a strong argument. The unity of the Pentateuch. One director. One director. Yeah, one director, that's right, you know, that uh, we don't see a large gap, it does, you know, something missing between Genesis and Exodus where Moses picks up with an eyewitness account. Rather, it fits perfectly and it's in Jewish history. And for, a, for almost 2,000 years of Christian history, um, in New Testament times, everybody believed that Moses wrote all five books. It was only in the 1800s when liberals with a different approach to scripture, denying miracles, denying divine inspiration and stuff like that, they came up with new theories. And so today, probably the majority of a religious leadership believes the liberal viewpoint that Moses didn't really write the book. You see, the only people that believe that Moses wrote the book are are like fundamentalists and evangelicals. Who, who went to good schools, you see, went to conservative schools where they, they teach a conservative hermeneutic for interpreting the Bible, you know, where you assume that all scripture is from God and it's accurate and authoritative and therefore to be taken at face value. So that's the crux of the issue, you know, the evidence that he did write some of it, right, and the unity of all five books together. And the fact that if there is a God, why couldn't he reveal it to Moses? So, it's not a problem. It's very logical. It makes perfect sense to a person who operates on the assumptions that we operate on. Okay. And there is other evidence in the Old Testament that uh, even in Old Testament times, people always attributed the law to Moses. And the, and the events in the book of Genesis to Moses' writing. So if we assume mosaic authorship of the book of Genesis, then when do you think the book was written? When do you think the book of Genesis was written if Moses wrote it? When he, when he, when he was alive. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe when he was up on the mountain for 40 days. One of the times. Okay. God told him different things. There are any number of specific possibilities that specific junctures, you know? I mean, the, the spies were gone for 40 days. What was Moses doing for 40 days? Well, um, we had princes looking after a lot of the minor details. Right. Yeah, at that time. So but then he could have written it uh, during the 40 days that he was on the mountain, too. Sure. You know? Or maybe he was a very disciplined man and he, and he set aside two hours every afternoon to write. You know, we don't know. We can't prove any of that. It's just that if Moses wrote it, it's obvious that he had to write it during his lifetime. So when did he live? Nine. Close. Okay. You're off a hundred years. Yeah. Somewhere between 1500 and 1400 BC. Specifically, the wilderness wanderings, if you take a conservative viewpoint, there's a conservative and liberal view for these dates. Right? The conservative viewpoint is that the the journey from Egypt to, Pal uh, to Canaan uh, went from 1450 to 1410 BC. So that's in the, that's in the 15th century BC. And so it was sometime during that span of time. Now the the more liberal dating of these events places it back in 12 and 1300. Even a couple of hundred years later, right? but uh, I think that the older date is better. 1450 to 1410 BC, sometime during that. Okay. Uh, I'll read you one paragraph uh, that that addresses the critical dating scheme. Okay, uh, from Unger. Under his Bible handbook, he says, the critics assume that the Jehovistic editors wrote about 850 B.C., 
the Elohist editors about 750 BC, the Deuteronomist editors about 621 BC, and the priestly editors about 500 BC. One of the principal arguments against Mosaic authorship for many years was the claim that writing in the 14th century BC was unknown. And therefore, Moses could not have been the author. How could he have written when there was not even any writing? Unger points out the evidence from a place called Erech that is mentioned in Genesis chapter 10 in the Table of Nations, uh, which is modern Warka on the lower Euphrates River in ancient Babylon, that writing went back as far as 3400 to 3300 BC. And that's only been a a, di a discovery that's taken place in the last hundred years. See? And so after these theories about other ways that the book of Genesis was written became commonplace in seminaries and churches, the evidence came in that yes, in fact, there was writing that even predated Moses by a thousand, by uh, over a thousand years. Like over fifteen hundred years. They, they know that people were writing way before Moses. So there's no reason why Moses couldn't have written that sort of thing. Is the, is the book of Genesis full of myths and, and traditions? Is it just legends? Was there a literal Adam and Eve? You know, I'll bet you if you just went out and asked ten people on the street, was there a literal Adam and Eve? Was there a garden? Was there a snake? And was there a fruit on a tree? Probably 90% of them would deny it in our culture. You know, 9 out of 10 people don't believe that stuff is real. And so, if it's not real, then this book is not authentic. Because it comes across as if it's real. It doesn't say it's a legend. Right? It tells us, it, it's, it speaks the same way here as it does when it talks about uh, King David. And he's a historical figure, corroborated in archaeology. You know, it, it comes across as if it's the same information on the same level. So, if if it comes across that way as if it's telling this real history, but it's not real history, then then what you have is you have fraudulent writing. You have you have a book that's not authentic, not trustworthy. That's a that's a key question when you're talking about this book of Genesis in the Bible. Because if people can convince you that the first 11 chapters are not authentic history, then that's a big blow against the truthfulness of it. Right? It doesn't logically follow then that we would put too much confidence in it. While most liberal thinkers relegate the book of Genesis to the realm of mythology, claiming all of the first 11 chapters to be Hebrew myths, and most of the rest to be largely unverifiable Hebrew tradition, the evidence continues to mount in support of the historicity of the book. Example, Genesis chapter 10 has a table of nations. And the more archaeologists uncover in the Middle East, the more evidence there is to support that those nations actually existed just like Genesis chapter 10 says they existed and that they were related to each other the way they were related. Turn with me to chapter 10. <coughs> chapter 10, verse 2. The sons of Japheth were Gomer, and Magog, and Madai, and Javan, and Tubal, and Meshech, and Tiras. Now we know where some of those sons settled because there are, if in fact in the world today, places with these names, with some of these names. Where are they? In Mago. geography. Mago. Huh? Mago. Magog? Okay. Well, in the New World, many of the New World names came from the Old World, and we're talking about the Old World. Okay. So, so where were the where was the Old wor Where in the Old World is uh, Maedai, for example? Where? In the 
Persia. Oh. Okay, oh. it's north of Persia. It's it's today where Azerbaijan yeah. and where all that ethnic turmoil is happening between the Black Sea and the the other sea, whatever it's called. All right. Uh, no. But it's it's east of the of the Black Sea or the Caspian. Okay, it's up in southern Russia. Okay, that's that's where these guys, uh, the descendants of Japheth, settled. They were they were the they became the Teutonic people. It goes on and says, and the sons of Gomer were Ashkenath, Riphath, and Togarma. And uh, the word. Uh, Togarma is related to Germany. That's right. You know, uh, arch archaeologically and linguistically, uh, the descendants uh, of Jesus. Continue on with this. Uh, the sons of Javan were Elisha and Tarshish and Katim and Dodanim. Now, Katim and Dodanim are references in uh, in ancient history to Greece and to Macedonia. Okay, Katim is related to. Uh, and, and by the way, on the map there, if you look. Uh, what island is closest in the Mediterranean to Greece? What large island? Crete. Okay? And then Cyprus. Okay? And as a matter of fact, uh, ancient history shows that the inhabitants, the Greek inhabitants of, of, of southern, southern Greece, you know, formed a, an empire that spread across the Mediterranean and uh, dominated these islands, you see, and they were known as the Katim, and the Katim eventually landed on the east, east on the on the coast of Palestine, and and they formed the Philistines, and, and that's just the way it goes on here. Um, Tarshish is a reference to Spain, okay, so these the descendants became seafaring peoples, see, settled the coastlands. We come up to um, uh, 13, verse 13. Uh, let's back up to verse 11. Out of that land, uh, we're talking Babylon here, the Fertile Crescent. Out of the Fertile Crescent went forth Asher to the northwest, built in Nineveh, and the city of Rehoboth and Kela, and Rasim between Nineveh and Kela, the same as a great city. And Mitzrayim begot Ludim, and Anamim, and Lahavim, and Naphtuhim, and Pathrusim, and Kasluhim, Notice this, out of whom came the Philistines and Kaphtarim. Okay? And uh, so he relates the Philistines to peoples that descend, that, that went west from the Fertile Crescent and settled in Western Asia Minor. Okay? So these people then settled the islands of the sea and eventually landed in Philistia. Okay? Now, the connections then between the people movements, where these people originated and where their descendants traveled to and what they eventually became known as in certain locations. According to the Bible, that information has been corroborated 100%. Whatever archaeology has uncovered is, is exactly what the Bible says. It's accurate. Yeah, it explains it. And so the table of nations, the general picture of the origin of languages, according to chapter 11, Babel, in the modern, you know, what is known as the Fertile Crescent, ancient Babel, is the place where the languages seem to have started from. English is related to Sanskrit. Where did Sanskrit come, come from? Sanskrit came from the, uh, is an Indo-European language. Indo-European, in other words, the English, Latin, German, French, you know, all of those languages are, are related geographically to the people who spoke Sanskrit. And the, the Sanskrit language is related to people who came from Babylon. Okay? That's, that's what is known today in the world in linguistics, right? And of course, that perfectly fits 
what Genesis chapter 11 seems to tell us, that they were all there at Babylon and God scattered them. See? So they went from Babylon to India, and then from India the language speakers, you know, it developed and, and evolved, you know, westward across to where we are today in English. Okay? It fits. There's no contradiction between the Bible's information. The Table of Nations, the general picture of the origin of languages, the worldwide geological evidence, supportive of a worldwide cataclysm. I was telling the young people on Sunday, Sunday morning right here in this classroom that uh, a gentleman came to the Bible College uh, when I was young, when it was located in southern Ontario, who had worked for years as a geologist and as a prospector for Shell Oil Company in northern Canada. And he would take his Geiger counter around, you know, and look for uranium, and uh, he would take his other equipment and look for oil deposits way up north. And he traveled to the Arctic. And he took pictures, he showed them to me, of coral reefs sticking out on the shoreline of the Arctic, where the Arctic tundra meets the Arctic Ocean. Coral reefs coral reefs. The only place coral grows is in places like South America, you know, and the Pacific, you know, where you have uh, a consistently warm climate, you know, water temperature is over 80 degrees. Consistently. It would die if it ever got cold. You see. What, where in the world do we find an evolution teaching us something that that explains coral reefs in, in, in the Arctic tundra today. Evolution doesn't explain that. You know, uh, the only thing that explains that is the biblical doctrine of creation and the flood. That at one time there was a, a 40 days worth of water canopy around the world, you see, which created a worldwide greenhouse effect where the climate was the same everywhere. And it was a it was a uh, tropical climate, you see. And so therefore, coral would grow in, in what today is known as our Arctic, you see. But then the flood came, the canopy was destroyed, instant polarization at the, at the caps of the, you know, based on the magnetic field, you see, which created the ice age, you see, um, you know, and, um, and, and the breakup of the original continent, or the original landmass, Earth, that at one time probably was all connected into the various continents. Right? And so the flood uh, really well explains the geological structure of our world. You can go to a certain point on the eastern shores of South America, and they go latitudinally east across to the western shores of Africa. And you can do this repeatedly at different points around the globe. And you can see how the, the land formations and the strata of rock match at those widely separated points because at one time they weren't separated, they were together. Mm -hmm. See, and that is only explained adequately by the flood. And even today, I read in uh, one of uh, the documents that comes from the Institute for Creation Research that uh, with the use of lasers today, measurement have be has become so precise that they are able to measure between two points, uh, one on this continent and one on another continent, and they are still finding that the continents are still not yet at uh, 4,000 years after the flood. That, that the whole surface of the earth is still floating around and hasn't quite come to rest yet, that the continents are still moving apart at a rate of a quarter of an inch a year, you know, that much a year, with the use of lasers they're able to detect that. Stuff like that shows that it, you know something massive must have happened to cause these things to move. So, so you put all that together, and uh, there are even evidence from ancient Egyptian records and monuments that there were famines in that part of the world, in Palestine, at the time that the Bible says that there was a famine that caused Jacob and his sons to go to Egypt. Stuff like that. Ancient, secular, extra-biblical 
archaeological information corroborates the teaching of the Bible in the book of Genesis. And so there's no reason for us not to trust this record. It's accurate. It's accurate. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the chronology of the events in the book of Genesis. And I, I know we're... Uh, Maybe we should take a five minute break, but we have to make a short one because uh, we got started a half an hour late. Okay, just time for a break. Okay, uh, we're just picking up with a little quick survey of the chronology of events in the book. Uh, this is about page uh, four or five in your notes. The first three chapters in Genesis record events in the undated past. The Bible doesn't tell us what year before Christ that uh, creation took place. But creationist scholars uh, believe these events to be literal and historical and possibly to be dated between 10,000 B.C. and 4,000 B.C. Um, a, a famous... Uh, that's, a mis that's a spelling mistake there. I've got Morris Parker and under there it should be Unger. <laughs> um, A uh, famous uh, Anglican archbishop named Usher uh, once calculated on the basis of the genealogies that the creation took place in the year 4004 B.C. <laughs> All right. The problem with that is that uh, you find when you compare the genealogies of uh, Genesis chapters 4 and 5 and chapter 11 with the genealogies of First Chronicles, the first nine chapters, with the genealogies given in other places in the prophets and in the first chapters in Matthew and Luke, that sometimes there are discrepancies in the sense that there are gaps, unforeseen gaps, Later, later, later genealogical lists will put people in between two people mentioned in earlier genealogical lists as being the father of, of a son, when it, it turns out that this person here was in fact the grandfather of the next person in the list. What would that do in terms of the time frame? It would greatly in expand the time frame covered by these people's lives in the first list, see, by information in the later list. Okay? And the word son is used sometimes in a narrow sense, literally the son of, sometimes in a broader sense, in the, in, as a descendant of. Okay? We use the, use the same word loosely in our culture that way. And, um, so what does that mean? And so that is why it's difficult. We're simply expressing why it is difficult to come up with a precise date for, for creation. Conser awesome. Conservative creationists generally put it between four and five or 6,000 BC, okay, which is a whole lot different than evolutionists. <laughs> Even the most extreme uh, creationists who, who might place creation at 10 or 15,000 BC are nowhere near the uh, the estimates for for the beginning of the <coughs> world as we know it, you know, in, in evolutionary thinking. Um, dates from Abraham down can be estimated but are tentative. I believe, um, from what you know, reading I've done, that uh, Abraham probably lived as far on the other side of Christ as we live on this side of Christ. You know, this is 1996 A.D., and I believe that Abraham lived right around 1900 B.C. Okay, so that's almost 4,000 years ago. You see, and uh, according to this chart, um, Abraham. No, I don't have it on this chart. I have another chart. Abraham lived about uh, 2,100 years after creation if you go by the genealogical records in the book of Genesis, about 2,100 years after creation. So if, if Abraham lived, say, 1,900 years B.C., you add another 
2100 years to that and that brings you to what 30 uh, what, what did I say 1900 plus what yeah about 3000 BC right which kind of puts us in the ballpark here well, you know that, that changes Yeah, uh, it, I'm not sure if I have the exact date there because I'm just going from memory on that point. Yeah. You know, but you can actually work out uh, according to the biblical geneal genealogical data. We're going to do some of that this morning for for our chronological study. So I want to hurry through this. Uh, we'll come back to this point. But a conservative estimation of the span of events in the Book of Genesis ranged from about 5,000 B.C. at creation to 1,500 B.C. at the time of Moses. Right, because Moses lived about 1500 BC, and that's where the Book of Exodus starts. You know, and so we're looking at anywhere from a period of, uh, you know, maybe two to three thousand or 3,500 years covered in the Book of Genesis. As a matter of fact, there is no other book in the Bible that covers so much history. We have a massive amount of human history just touched on, just breezed over in the book of Genesis in 50 chapters. See, The rest of the whole Bible only covers uh, 1,600 years of history. The whole rest of the Bible, from Exodus right to the end of Revelation, it's only 100 years in the New Testament. You know, Plus the time from Moses to Christ, you know, it's 1,500 years. So we have about 1,600 years in the rest of the Bible, but in Genesis we have over 3,000 years you know, or more. It helps put it in perspective. Morris, in this textbook, says that um, the, the, the first and last events in the book of Genesis are about 2,308 years apart, assuming no gaps in the genealogical list. If you use the data given in these chapters in the book of Genesis, a chart can be drawn showing the overlapping age spans of the patriarchs. I've done that here. We're going to go through it in detail in a moment, but I've just shown you how their lives overlapped. You see? And you can draw some very interesting conclusions. We know that the flood took, took place in the year 1656 after creation, according to the record. And Methuselah, the oldest man, the man who lived the longest of any known human being, died the year of the flood. Now, he was, he was not a wicked man, so it's unlikely that he died in the flood, or he would have been on the ark, because he was a righteous man. He was a godly person, so far as we know. You see? So it's likely he just died a natural death prior to the flood. You see, But if you take Methuselah and run up from the beginning of his life, you can actually see that his lifespan overlapped Adam's lifespan for about 200 years. And it's very likely that since a lot of spreading hadn't happened around the world at this point yet, that, uh, and, and we're only talking one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight generations of people, it's very likely that these people might have known each other. It's not unlikely, you see, especially in a culture that was more Oriental than Western. You know, Western culture, there's a, uh, you know, a lot of there is a, there is a very evident lack of respect for older people and so forth. But in Chang's culture, you know, the generations are much closer in terms of respect for each other, knowledge of each other. You know, passing on information from one generation to another. I'm sure it's a lot closer, a lot more detailed in, the, in their generation. Okay, it's, it makes interesting things. Um, you can draw some interesting conclusions from those kinds of studies. Okay, I'm going to leave the rest of this stuff here for you. Um, you know, the key verses in the chapters, uh, you can just read, read over that stuff. The, the theme of the book is God's sovereignty. The fact that uh, anything that you can think of had a beginning in the book of Genesis. Right? Uh, the beginning of nations, the beginning of languages, the beginning of sorrow, the beginning of redemption, the beginning of sin, the beginning of the material world in which you live, you know, everything. Um, now, the only thing that had a beginning that isn't very 
that I don't think is even directly mentioned but is only inferred in the book of Genesis is the angelic realm right? you have to go to Job and Isaiah and Ezekiel in the Bible and the book of Colossians to find out where angels came from Colossians says that angels are created right? Isaiah and Ezekiel describe Satan and describe him as a cherub that was created by God Job chapter 33 refers to the angels rejoicing and clapping their hands on the third day of creation when God separated the land from the water and set the boundaries for, for where the water could go and where it couldn't go it says the sons of God rejoiced and clapped you know, when, God, when God did that so it's obvious that the angels were in existence prior to the third day of creation mentioned in the book of Genesis do you believe the, the fall was before or after The, the fall of man? No. No, I, I don't believe that um, the fall of uh, Satan, the rebel, the angelic rebellion, took place until after the creation week, because God looked on everything that He had made and says, "And behold, it was very good." You see, at the end of the six days, you see, the angels were in existence. I think that between chapters 2 and 3 is when the rebellion, angelic rebellion takes place because then, then in chapter 3 we have Satan coming in the form of the serpent and deceiving men. He was obviously cast out of heaven you know, and demoted yeah. as it were. You know, logically I think that that's yeah. what you can support. Maybe we should read that verse. I think it's Job 33. It might be Job 38. It's a fascinating verse. God is interrogating Job here. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if you have understanding. Who hath laid the measures of it if thou knowest? Or who has stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are its foundations fastened? Or who has laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who has shut up the sea with doors when it broke forth as if it had issued out of the womb? When I made the cloud its garment and thick darkness a swaddling band for it and broke up for it my decreed place and set bars and doors and said, Thus far shalt thou go, come, and no farther, and here shall thy proud waves be stayed. So it's talking about the foundations of the earth right and setting the limits for the sea you know in the context very poetic language here but there appears to be a reference here by God himself back to the I think it's the third day of creation when he separated the uh, the water and the and the sea maybe that's the second day of creation you understand what we're talking about though when he said uh, let the earth bring forth dry land and call it earth and let the waters be called seas. On that day of creation, there were angels, sons of God, shouted for joy. See that? There were no people there, so it has to be a reference to angels. And, the, and in fact, you can prove from a variety of references that the phrase son of God is often a reference to angels. So you believe the earth created No, I, I think that uh, 
Well, you can't prove it. You know, I'm, I'm only, I'm only giving you my opinion. You know, I think that since they were created, yeah. that it's logical to assume that they were created during the when everything else was created. You know, sometime during that process, but it's not necessary that they were. Did you know that, that Genesis, when he six days he created each day, he said, uh, for example, chapter one verse five. Uh, chapter one verse four, first day he said, God saw the light and it was good. Okay. And second day, no mention. The third day, with the time, the he, called, he called the water seas, and God saw that it was good. Uh, time, time, he said that it was good. Yeah. So only, and third day also, uh, it was good. Yeah. Uh, first day, it was good. The 18 said, yeah. uh, God saw it was good. But only, Second day, he didn't say that. The, from verse six to eight, God made the permanent divide the water, and of the permanent from the water above the permanent, and it was so. And God called the permanent heaven and evening and morning. And the second day, he didn't mention only second day when he made the permanent in the air. Because so what are we going to conclude from that? I heard it that one summer from oh, the pastor. No. Each time God created. Six days, God all the time, it was good, it was good. Except second day. Second day he he made a permanent. The Satan he live in the in the air, in the heaven. So uh, he didn't he didn't say it was good. But you can find it. Yeah. Everything. I see that. Yeah. But so I it implied the Satan he already corrupted before the creation yeah. and he 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 stayed there in the air. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was falling more down mm -hmm. when the disciples said, oh, "We saw the Satan he fall down mm -hmm. from the there." And that day, Jack Barnett he says three heavens. So the Satan he falling down the second heaven. And I don't remember. Yeah. I I wouldn't make that statement in John 12, where the disciples saw Christ, Satan fall from heaven, or where Jesus saw Satan fall from heaven. A reference to the same thing, you know, uh, necessarily, uh, it, because Colossians tells us that when Christ died, he destroyed Satan, and I think that 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 Christ was either given a vision, you know, or predicting in symbolic language this the approaching judgment of Satan by Christ on the cross, the ultimate wound to the head, you know, predicted in Genesis. Jeff, I just. The three, three level of heaven, mm -hmm. and the Satan he 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 down a certain level, mm -hmm. so he certain level air he control. So between the God status, the three three floor heaven and us, there is a the, the Satan control a certain certain space. Right. Anyway, so the second day why when God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I. The only thing that argues against that is that the, at, in chapter two, at the summary, uh, it, uh, actually at the end of chapter one, the summary of all six six days, and God saw everything that He had made everything and behold it was very good 131 which summarizes all six days chain see it implies that what he did on the second day was good too 31 is maybe there is a six days everything he made in six days yeah. all animal and all life yeah. on earth yeah. he said this is a good doesn't necessarily mean the whole from first day. Yeah. Again, we're not going to be able to be dogmatic about this point, you know. But um, yeah. 
as a matter of fact, it does not imply. It doesn't it doesn't imply or infer uh, at all in chapters one and two that the devil had fallen? It doesn't tell us that. It doesn't suggest yeah, that. Yeah, my point is just yeah. interesting. Words, yeah. Right? Yeah, and uh, I think that that's an important point for the same reason that. Um, that I don't think that evolution could have been the divine method for creation. You know, and this is a point that uh, Morris makes because evolutionary, the whole evolutionary process is based on the principle of death. On the death principle? Evolution? Yeah. You know, the, the survival of the fittest, which means the death of the unfit, you know, of all of all different species, right? And and if evolution, and therefore this, the death of unfit species, was the way that God brought about man, Homo Homo sapien, finally, then what we what we have then is we have death without a cause. You know, according to the Bible. By one man, sin entered the world, and death by that that man's sin. In chapter three, see. So according to the Bible, the cause for the grounds for the death principle being in existence in this world is the fall of man, the rebellion of God. In chapter three, and so you can't have death prior to that event without a just cause, without a, a legal basis for it. It's, death is a judgment, right? And where's where's the sin that that creates the judgment? And of course, now many people would argue that Satan fell, you know, between verse one and verse two in chapter one. You see, and therefore God poured out His wrath, and therefore there was all kinds of death, you know, in the eons of time prior to verse 2 with the recreation you see they would argue many people would argue that 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 makes science and christianity fit you know that there was an original creation that we have the evolutionary billions of years of evolution you know that allowed for the development of all the species you see and you know, and uh, and death because we have divine rebellion in heaven, and therefore the earth itself was judged by God and allowed to be waste and void. And so, you know, these are difficult questions. You have to have an answer. Back to our subject here. Um, it's important that you see that Genesis is related to the rest of the Bible as a really foundational book. Um, it's the first book of the Bible in position, it always has been, in all versions it is. the 
So Genesis is very, very necessary. It explains why things are as they are, and Revelation shows that things are as they His father Lamech died five years before the flood. Yeah. Yeah. It says 120 years, or it implies 120 years. Okay. And so um, Methuselah, his grandfather, and his father would have known that he was building the ark. His great great grandfather wouldn't have though. He would have died. Let's let's turn and we're gonna spend the last twenty minutes here just going through this chronology. Okay? So chapter five. What I would suggest get a piece of paper. A line piece of paper. And then get another one underneath it. Turn it 90 degrees to it. And so what you end up with is a grid of quarter inch squares. You can look through the paper and should be able to see the other lines underneath. And that'll, that'll or, or if you've got a piece of graph paper, and that's even better. And that's the best thing. You should actually buy a couple of sheets of graph paper for this course. Because you're going to be doing chronologies several times. Okay? And let each quarter inch represent 100 years. Okay? You, know, you follow what I'm saying? Put one sheet underneath the other so that you've got a grid there so you can see it. Okay, well, that'll do it then. Can you see the lines over there, Mandy? Barely? Okay. Well, anyway, you can, all we're doing here is just the, is the exercise, just where you get the idea, and then you can do it up properly uh, in your notes, okay? Sure. Right. But um, even if you want to do it roughly, you need at least a dozen lines here, okay? You need, you need a dozen lines from top to bottom, and you need one, two, three, four, five, six. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 15, 15, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. You need about 21 or 22 lines left and right. Okay? And 
let every square start with zero and let the first line represent 100 years. Okay? So each block is 100 years of, of history. Okay, so Adam is obviously the first generation. We have to start here in chapter 5. Verse 3. It says that Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness. So the next line, the next generation, look at this, starts at 130 years on the graph. Right here. See? It starts at 130 years, so it's all of the first square and one-third of the next square, is it, right? Well, it's 30% of the, of the next 100 years, right? So just guess, guesstimate, draw your next line, and that's the beginning of Seth, okay? So if you don't understand, ask me, okay? But you've got Adam in the first block going across. It's the first generation, the first line, starting at zero. And we're just going to work our way through and put the information on it as we go. Okay? So the next piece of information is we're told that Adam was 130 when Seth was born. So Seth begins at this point. So draw the line, and then the next generation, Seth, carries on from this point. Okay? And verse 4 says, The days of Adam after he had begotten Seth were 800 years, and he begot sons and daughters. And it tells us that all the days that Adam lived were 930 years. Does that add up? 130 plus 800? Does that add up to 900? I want you to follow, I, I want you to follow me, okay? <laughs> right? Or if you want, we can just turn the tape off and you can do it on your own. I'd like to guide you to get started here. Verse 4 says that Adam lived for 800 more years and he was 930 when he died. So now you've got something to verify. 130 when his son was born, his first son. Well, actually it wasn't his first son, it was his last son. Okay, or his, I shouldn't say even his last son, it was his third son. Okay. Should have the overhead here so it'd be easier for everybody to see. Yeah. Are you having trouble with what I'm asking you to do here? I let it write down briefly, so yeah. I don't need to be right. Are you are you having trouble following this? Well, here. I just don't have my line. Okay. It makes it harder. Well, uh, make yourself lines. Just just rough it in. Yeah, I'm to do it for you. It's no good to uh, put anything on there that isn't proved by the text. Okay, that's you have to stay biblical here. So verse three starts you out. He was 130 when his when his when the third son Seth was born. Okay. Well, you could. You could, for each one of these points, you could just, you know, give a note like A, B, or C, you know, and put the references in. Okay, verse 5 tells us, or 4 and 5 tells us that Adam lived for 800 more years after Seth was born, which 130 plus 800 comes to 930. And it tells you that he died at 930, so there you go. It fits. 
Okay, so extend Adam's life right to 930 on the on the scale and block that in. Draw a rectangle. And the first rectangle starts at zero and, go, and goes to 130 or 930 rather. Okay, and that's Adam. Write his name in there. Okay, verse 6 tells us that Seth lived 105 years and begot Enosh. Okay, so now to get this proper, you've got to add 105 to 130. Because Adam was 130, right? 0 to 130. Are you with me? This is when Seth was born, when Adam was 130. Okay. Now Seth is 105, and he begot his son. So add 105 to that, and you end up with 235. So that note that shows you where on the graph to start Enosh at year 235. You see that? At year 235. Okay. So mark that on there, 235. At the year 235. Enosh was born. And Seth lived after he begot Enosh 807 years and begot sons and daughters, and all the days of Seth were 912 years and he died. So verses 7 and 8, 807 years. So you add 807 to 235, you end up with what? 1042. 1042. So now you know where to plot the end of Seth's life on the graph at the year 1042. <clears throat> Make sense? And it tells you that he lived 